And welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Invasive Blood Pressure, Fundamentals and Best Practices for Preclinical -pre Research. This is Andy Henton from Inside Scientific, and it is my pleasure to be your host for today's event. Our session is brought to us by AD Instruments, and will focus on the importance and impact of high fidelity solid state catheters as it relates to accuracy, consistency, and research outcomes. The presentation will be led by Dr. Tom Smith, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Dr. Smith's research interests range from musculoskeletal adaption and injury to electrical stimul stimulation therapy and the study of neuromuscular agents. In collaboration with the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, he is currently researching the use of tissue engineered constructs for repair of peripheral nerve gaps following injury, tissue engineered allografts for ACL, tendon and meniscus repairs, and murine models of myocardial infarction to test stem cell therapies utilizing coronary artery ligations performed as survival surgeries in mice. Today, Dr. Smith will discuss the fundamental properties of pressure measurements in the vascular system, including the history and physics behind solid state manometry and how this technology compares in contrast to other modal modalities for blood pressure measurement. In addition, he will share insights on how scientists must approach their experimental design to ensure blood pressure measurements will lead to consistent and accurate research findings. My name is Tom Smith. I'm a uh, cardiovascular physiologist by avocation. And uh, uh, today I'd like to share with you uh, my experiences with uh, invasive blood pressure and solid state catheters, uh, primarily in preclinical models. So today we'd like to cover the following topics. Uh, We'd like to look over and evaluate the goals of our blood pressure measurements. We're going to examine uh, both indirect as well as direct measurement techniques. We'll discuss advantages and disadvantages of uh, both direct and indirect and then differing methodologies associated with those. And finally, we'll uh, brush upon applications of these technologies and methods uh, as well as choices that might be uh, advantageous for the individual experiments depending upon their design. So in measurements of systemic arterial pressure, we're really uh, measuring a pulse waveform that reflects the activity of the heart uh, as well as the status and state of the vascular tree. We can measure systemic arterial pressure uh, or actually assess it either directly or indirectly. We can use plethysmography, which is essentially the technique that's used clinically in people when we go to the doctor and have a blood pressure cuff placed on our arm. Uh, or we can measure blood pressure directly using either a manometric system comprised of a catheter, fluid-filled catheter system and blood pressure transducer. Uh, we can use a solid state uh, blood pressure transducer, or we can use a combination of these different techniques. So let's address indirect measures, uh, indirect methods for measuring or assessing systemic arterial pressure. Uh, this is plethysmography. Plethysmography involves the use of some sort of a uh, tail cuff uh, inflation device here to be able to occlude blood flow within the tail of the, of the preclinical model, the rodent usually, uh, as well as a sensor that can actually detect when pressure within the vascular system exceeds pressure within the cuff and uh, can note when systemic uh, systolic pressure is detected. In order to be able to make these measurements, uh, the animal has to be restrained. We, we, the animal can't really move around the cage with this on their tail. So restraint is required. Uh, however, the animal can be conscious. So this is advantageous. We don't have to anesthetize the animal and it's a minimally uh, disruptive procedure. It does require uh, animal care and use committee approval, but it's, uh, it's not painful to the animal and it, it's minimally distressful. Sorry. So what are the advantages of this process? Its primary advantage is that we can perform uh, repeated measurements in an individual animal uh, over time uh, under similar conditions. So we can have a cohort of animals. We can look at them before we start some sort of a drug treatment or intervention. And then we can track the 
systolic arterial pressure of these animals over time uh, with continued treatment and even following discontinuation of treatment. The primary advantage is that it's non-invasive. Uh, we can have several apparatuses so we could test really uh, several animals at a time. And it is, it is sensitive to being able to detect trends in systolic arterial pressure over time. So what are the disadvantages of plethysmography? Well, we have to recognize that the tail in rodents, uh, rats and mice, is thermoregulatory. So if the animal's in a cold environment, uh, as most laboratories are, then the caudal artery, the tail artery, is vasoconstricted. And so the animal needs to be warmed up, uh, and then they will dilate the tail artery and we can make our measurement. So we have to place the animal into a, a warming box of some sort, or we have to provide uh, warming to the feet. So we can place the animal on a warming pad, uh, which will then uh, cause the animal to vasodilate their tail, and we'll be able to measure the uh, systolic arterial pressure. Secondly, we need to consider that the tail artery is a long, small blood vessel extending from the aorta back to the, the tail. Uh, and we can have constrictions in the tail artery uh, between the aorta and the tail, uh, and that will cause an attenuation or a decrease in the systolic arterial pressure that's actually measured at the site of measurement, in this case the tail. So we have to be aware of that and uh, take that into account in our interpretation. We can have observational errors uh, or psychogenically uh, induced errors caused by the manipulation of the animal. Uh, recent data shows that when the animal is, is lifted and moved about by their tail, uh, then this causes a physiological response. Uh, similarly, restraint, putting the animal in a restrainer can cause a physiologic response. If these physiologic responses affect the systemic uh, systolic pressure, then your measurements will be influenced by these conditions. So we have to be aware of those. Some of this uh, Observational error can be overcome with training, but uh, it cannot be completely eliminated. And finally, we have to be aware that uh, just as in humans, uh, in plethysmography using an occlusive cuff, one size of cuff doesn't fit all rodents. So some mice are bigger than others, some rats are bigger than others. And we have to look at the uh, diameter of the tail and the width of the blood pressure cuff and make sure we have the correct match between those two. If the cuff is either too wide or too narrow, then we'll either underestimate or overestimate the systolic arterial pressure. So these are all things that the investigator needs to be aware of uh, when using plethysmography. Which brings us to uh, invasive measurements of arterial pressure. So plethysmography is non-invasive. If we want to measure arterial pressure directly, uh, we can use invasive techniques. So we're going to discuss the goals of this invasive pressure measurements. Uh, what are the challenges, uh, what uh, issues of fidelity associated with these systems uh, need to be addressed, and uh, what methodologies are available. So the goals uh, are to provide an accurate measurement of the blood pressure waveform over time. So we see a representative uh, tracing of a systemic arterial pressure uh, on the right panel with a systolic pressure. Uh, noted here, a diastolic pressure noted here, a dichrotic notch uh, associated with closure of the aortic valve uh, noted here, and uh, ideally we want to be able to accurately measure all of these events, and we want to be able to measure them uh, in an appropriate time-related fashion. In other words, we don't want to record a pulsatile event that occurs uh, actually uh, at a different time than, than it does in reality. So our recording apparatus can actually induce a temporally adjusted uh, measurement error. So if we look at the aorta and the different blood vessels here, we see that we can have different shapes of waveforms. But regardless of where we measure the pressure, we, we want to have an accurate representation of waveforms. If we move to the panel on the right, uh, showing events of the cardiac cycle, we can add another uh, ordinate uh, here, and or I'm sorry, abscissa here, and uh, imagine we have an electrocardiogram uh, occurring, and, and we can see that uh, 
different events of the cardiac cycle in terms of activity of the heart, uh, resulting in opening of the aortic valves and closing of the aortic valves. Uh, as these occur, uh, we need to be able to relate these back to electrical events going on in the heart. Uh, if we're measuring ventricular pressure, that's a, that's a different question. Uh, there are systems available for doing that. Uh, we can do that with our direct measurements, but other factors have to be considered. But we do want to have an accurate measurement of what is the systolic pressure measured, what is the diastolic pressure measured, and what is our dichronic notch. So what are our challenges associated with making direct measurements or invasive measurements of arterial pressure in preclinical models? The two most commonly used uh, species of animals used in preclinical research are rats uh, and mice. So when we look at uh, vessel size within these, these creatures, uh, they can be relatively small. So we have to take that into account when we're designing our experimental design. Uh, and the recording requirements, uh, some invasive techniques require that the animal be anesthetized. Other techniques uh, allow the animal to be conscious. If it's important or essential that the animal uh, be awake during the recording procedure, then we need to take that into account in selection of our particular measurement techniques. In some cases, we can have a conscious animal, but he has to be restrained at least briefly uh, for connection of the measurement apparatus into a recording apparatus. And in some cases, the animal can be free ranging and moving about their cage uh, unimpaired, unrestrained and we can make measurements under those conditions. So depending upon whether you, you do or do not need the animal to be free ranging, uh, again, that can or can bias and, and influence our selection. And finally, some techniques uh, are only acute. We can only make the measurement uh, acutely. Uh, sometimes those measurements can be made subacutely over uh, several, several hours to days. Um, or sometimes we can have instrumentation that allows chronic measurement of arterial pressure over long periods of time. So we can track uh, the responses of an individual animal over time uh, as they respond to a treatment paradigm. So we talked a little bit about uh, challenges associated with invasive techniques, uh, one of those being vessel size. Probably the, the questions a lot of, of investigators ask is, I've got a mouse, I would like to measure arterial pressure. Uh, how hard is that? Uh, well, we're all assuming everybody has the surgical skills to be able to uh, isolate and cannulate these blood vessels, but we need to be aware of the size limitations. The mouse carotid artery is uh, typically about 500 microns in diameter, uh, which is relatively small, and uh, the mouse femoral artery is 400 microns. So uh, people often will select the mouse carotid artery uh, for cannulation for measurement of systolic arterial or basically pulsatile arterial pressure. Uh, but the investigator also needs to be aware that some uh, strains of mice do not have a complete circle of Willis. So that if we select a carotid artery for cannulation, we can compromise uh, cerebral circulation in those particular substrains of animals and uh, actually have cerebral infarcts in up to 30% of those animals. So cerebral infarcts can certainly impact uh, the measurement of arterial pressure, the arterial pressure that one's measuring. So it's uh, important to be aware of that. So if you're considering using a mouse and cannulating the common carotid artery, you should be aware that uh, you need to investigate whether or not that particular animal uh, has a complete circle of Willis. And these data can usually be found in the literature. The other reason that uh, vessel size becomes important is that uh, if we use a manometric, a catheter, and manometric technique, uh, we need to have, have a catheter material of some sort. So polyethylene 10 or PE10 is a commonly used uh, cannula material. Uh, PE10, as it comes off the spool, has an outside diameter of 610 microns. So uh, we have a pretty good appreciation that it's going to be really difficult to uh, put that into the carotid artery of a mouse. So we'll have to taper it, uh, which means that we'll reduce not only the outside diameter, but reduce the inside diameter. The inside diameter of PE10, uh, as it comes off the spool, is 280 microns, and this decreases uh, 
as we decrease the diameter with, with heating and stretching to uh, be able to make the catheter small enough to fit within the blood vessel. And finally, the length of the catheter uh, is important because we'll see later that it can affect the fidelity of our pressure recording. So the catheter uh, in an acute measurement uh, environment would need to at least e extend from the, uh, the site of insertion into the vascular tree over to a blood pressure transducer uh, or over to a uh, recording apparatus of some sort. So length of catheter can, can begin to play a big role if we have a very small catheter to start with, uh, small in diameter, and it's, it becomes longer and longer, then our fidelity will begin to, to decrease dramatically. Here's just an illustration of the uh, femoral artery in a mouse. We can see that it's, it's quite small, and uh, cannulation of the femoral artery is, is, can be challenging. It's uh, 400 microns. Uh, dissecting the femoral artery away from the femoral vein in a mouse uh, uh, can be particularly challenging. The femoral vein uh, is very delicate and uh, doesn't really respond well to manipulation. So what are our methodologies uh, for doing invasive measurements of arterial pressure? Uh, we mentioned briefly a catheter uh, manometer system. Uh, by that we mean we have some sort of uh, flexible, usually plastic tubing, uh, which is fluid filled. It's introduced directly into the vascular tree. It in turn is connected to a blood pressure uh, transducer, which is an electromechanical device, which changes the uh, pressure waveform, the pressure pulse that's detected within the uh, fluid column into an electrical signal, which can then be recorded and analyzed and calibrated. Uh, and that would be a catheter manometer system. We have solid state devices in which the blood pressure transducer itself is actually uh, on the uh, um, invasive device itself, so it's placed within the blood vessel. So the blood pressure transducer is here on the lateral surface of the solid state uh, catheter, and we can place that directly into the vascular tree. And finally, uh, we have telemetry available, in which case there, there are no external wires or tubes connecting the animal to the recording apparatus. It's all done uh, through either a fluid-filled catheter, a blood pressure transducer and transmitter, or some sort of a solid state transducer with a transmitter. And we'll discuss all of these techniques. So let's discuss uh, catheter manometric techniques first uh, for invasive measurements of arterial pressure. Uh, from a technology point of view, these uh, existed before solid state devices. So uh, let's, they are still in use in quite a few labs. So let's go over the components, the requirements and limitations of these systems. Uh, these, basically, we, we have to assemble some components. It's very rare to find these systems uh, off the shelf. Uh, and we have to have a fluid-filled catheter of some sort. It's one shown on the right. In this case, this is uh, polyethylene, or PE50. Uh, it's connected to a 23-gauge uh, blunt needle, or a lure stub adapter. Uh, in order to be able to flush this catheter and make sure that any, any blood which moves into the catheter can be removed, uh, we have a stopcock. We have a, uh, in this case, this is a blood pressure transducer, an electromechanical device, which will uh, change the pressure waveform into an electrical signal. And this is just another uh, stopcock, which allows us to fill this uh, blood pressure transducer uh, with fluid. And then there's a cable here going off to our recording device. So. Uh, these requirements say that we have to have some sort of a uh, semi-rigid catheter within the blood vessel. Uh, I say semi-rigid because if the catheter is very flexible and elastic, uh, then the catheter material itself uh, can expand and contract uh, with blood pressure uh, variations within the arterial tree and actually contribute to the pulse pressure waveform, which is not what we want. So it has to be semi-rigid, but it can't be so rigid that it, it uh, uh, cannot make small adjustments to uh, curvature of, uh, within the vascular tree. We have to have a fluid-filled system without air bubbles. If we look at our construct on the right, uh, we see chambers here and uh, interfaces between transducer and stopcock. Uh, there's a lumen within this uh, handle of the stopcock. Uh, there's an interface right here, there's another interface right here, another interface here. All these interfaces, 
uh, between materials and uh, components are places where air bubbles can occur. And uh, air bubbles are uh, uh, very detrimental to the fidelity of our waveform. The reason being, as the pressure waveform uh, enters this, this hydraulic or fluid filled system, changes in pressure will actually uh, compress small air bubbles. And the energy within that uh, waveform is uh, dispersed, leading to an attenuated signal when we get back to the recording device. So any air bubbles within this system, either in the, this uh, fluid filled part here, anywhere in the fluid filled system, will result in attenuation or a compromise of the fidelity of the uh, measured waveform. So finally, this is all connected back to a recording device of some sort. Uh, now it's usually a, a, a digital data collection system, uh, and these are these are uh, state of the art now. And, and for the most part, I've replaced all of our other techniques for recording apparatuses. So, so what are our limitations? Well, we talked a little bit about catheter size and composition. Uh, uh, we're required to use catheters of certain sizes to cannulate vessels. The vessels don't get any bigger, so we have to have to compromise and use a particular catheter size to match a vessel. And then finally, this can influence our frequency response uh, as part of our fidelity or, or accurate measurements of the changes in arterial pressure that we want to record. So uh, fidelity here is basically the ability of, of our system uh, to accurately measure the pressure waveform uh, as the fundamental, which is heart rate, uh, can increase. So this is an important component to consider. So we're looking at a uh, an animal model. Uh, they can have heart rates which are considerably higher than ours. We look at, at humans, have a, a essential heart rate of 60 beats per minute, then uh, the fundamental of that waveform is one hertz. Uh, it occurs once per second. Uh, in folks that have really uh, spent a lot of time studying the hemodynamics of, of uh, blood pressure recordings, uh, it's accepted that if we have an apparatus that's capable of, of uh, recording 10 to 15 times that fundamental, or uh, then we should be able to get an accurate reflection of the waveform components. So in this case, if we had a heart rate of 60 in a human, we would have to have a system that had a frequency response of 10 to 15 hertz to be able to record just this fundamental. Now, if the person ran on a treadmill and their heart rate ran up to 150, then uh, we'd have to have a higher frequency response. If we then look at our preclinical models uh, in a rat with a resting heart rate of 300, the fundamental now is 5 beats per second, or 5 hertz. So to be able to measure uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure accurately with under resting conditions in a rat, we would have to have a uh, frequency response in that system of 50 to 75 hertz. So that's, that's uh, we'll discuss things that affect that, but for a fluid manometer system, that means that that whole system has to have a frequency response of 50 to 75 hertz. If we now move to the mouse, uh, the mouse heart rate, at rest can be 600, uh, so the fundamental now is 10 hertz, uh, which requires 100 to 150 hertz frequency response. The mouse can increase their heart rate to uh, 800 or above within just a few seconds uh, in a conscious state and would require even higher frequency responses. So we begin to see that we have restrictions on the fidelity of our system, particularly with respect to frequency response, uh, imposed by uh, or actually dictated by the experimental model which we want to investigate. And this actually is a, 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 a graph uh, showing recordings made within a pressure chamber that's being driven by an acoustic speaker. So uh, the speaker is generating a sine wave of pressure uh, within this fluid filled uh, chamber and we're measuring it both with a solid state transducer and a fluid filled transducer. So this is basically uh, at a stimulation or a uh, speaker frequency of, of one cycle per second. So we see there's a, there's a pulsatile waveform that's being recorded uh, in this fluid filled system or in this, this chamber. 
and uh, our fluid filled catheter system uh, tracks that fairly well. However, as soon as we increase the frequency of our uh, pressure generator up to five cycles per second, we see some attenuation of both the high and uh, low pressure components of that pressure waveform. If we increase that again and double it to 10 hertz or 10 cycles per second, we see a dramatic attenuation of the recorded pressure, both the high and low pressures obtained with the fluid filled system. And if we increase it up to 25 hertz, we still see a, a high fidelity recording using uh, a solid state pressure transducer placed directly within the chamber uh, compared to uh, almost complete attenuation of the uh, pulsatile waveform obtained with a fluid filled catheter. We can see that there is a, a, a still a mean pressure here, but is not an accurate representation of the, the high and low pressures recorded within that system. We can also experience a, a phenomenon called phase shift. Uh, which means that uh, measurement of the pulsatile event, in our, in our case, the uh, systemic arterial pressure waveform, can be shifted in time compared to the actual event. So in this case, if we had an actual pressure that was uh, occurring here and had a, a peak uh, pressure here, if we had a phase shift within our system, the peak pressure would not be recorded until this much time after the original event. So this offset or theta uh, is caused by what's a phase shift in our recording system. Uh, this is, becomes important if we're looking at uh, a process or a system in which it's important to be able to correlate, uh, for example, events of the cardiac cycle with reflected arterial pressure measured in the arterial system. Uh, if we had a EKG superimposed down below here, we can see that we'd have a, a dramatic dissociation uh, between the physical events in terms of pressure generation uh, measured in the aorta and electrical events occurring in the heart and associated with contraction of the heart itself. So uh, we look at limitations with our catheter manometer technique. Uh, catheter size and composition uh, can affect overall uh, ability to cannulate things. Uh, our frequency response can be affected by catheter size and composition. And fundamentally, fidelity of a catheter manometer system is impacted by the length of the catheter, the diameter of the catheter, and it can be impacted by the transducer and recorder system. So generally speaking, the shorter the catheter, uh, the better the frequency response and better the fidelity. The larger the diameter of the catheter system, the better the fidelity. And finally, the transducer itself should be of high fidelity. Uh, it should not be affected by either temperature, ambient temperature, or by light. Uh, often transducers are uh, solid state devices and uh, they can be adversely affected by the light shining on them, or they can be changed by light shining on them. I wouldn't say adversely affected, but uh, if we turn on a light that wasn't on before, then our calibration could actually change. So what are our lim other uh, limitations of catheter manometric techniques? For subacute and repeated chronic recordings uh, of an animal that's instrumented with a indwelling catheter, in the arterial tree, uh, we want to record those within his own cage, then we have to tether the animal back to the recording apparatus, the blood pressure transducer and the recording apparatus. Uh, this means that the blood pressure transducer has to be placed outside the cage usually uh, at heart level to take into account any uh, hydrostatic columns existing between the transducer and uh, the animal's uh, right heart. And he has to, if he's in his own cage and he has to be tethered, then we have to, to actually manipulate the animal. We have to uh, find the end of the catheter. We have to clean it off, unplug it, uh, flush it, connect it to our rest of our catheter system, and then leave the animal alone. And actually acclimation of the animal following tethering can take up to two hours for heart rate and arterial pressure to drop back down to a, a some sort of a stable value, which will then 
persist for several hours. But uh, there is an acclimation period, so we, we can't really just connect the animal quickly, uh, take our measurement, and uh, disconnect him. Uh, we'll, we'll wind up with erroneous data, uh, erroneous in that it reflects the animal in a, in a state of agitation. If we want to make long-term recordings using uh, manometric techniques, uh, we have to have some sort of a hydraulic swivel located over the cage, some uh, tether between the animal and the swivel so that the animal can turn that swivel, and it requires continuous perfusion of the catheter so that we don't have uh, occlusion of the catheter over time. So the pressure waveform is uh, reflected along the length of the hydraulic catheter uh, over the uh, uh, continuous perfusion occurring within the catheter. It's a very low rate of, of perfusion, so it doesn't really generate a pressure of its own. Finally, what are the, what are the, uh, the transducer rec and recorder limitations? Essentially, all of our transducers are based upon uh, this electrical circuit, which is, uh, consists of a power supplier, or usually a DC voltage, and this is called a Wheatstone bridge. In the simplest Wheatstone bridge, we have uh, four resistive elements. Three of those elements uh, are static and known, and the fourth element, uh, shown here, is a, usually a strain gauge. And if we look at this, it, it looks uh, looks like a pale green, but if we envision this as a series of wires going back and forth, it represents one long wire, which uh, would have some resistance. So this is called a quarter bridge strain gauge, but as this strain gauge is, is bent or deflected, uh, these wires undergo stretching, and uh, as they stretch, the resistance within this whole array changes, and we have a variable resistor uh, represented by this strain gauge. And as this strain gauge is bent and moved, uh, then we'll have a change of voltage recorded across these two points in the Wheatstone bridge circuit. If we have two strain gauges, we can actually apply those to either side of uh, a deformable element. In this case, we have uh, one strain gauge, which is represented here as resistor one, uh, and we have a second strain gauge, blue one, represented as resistor two. As this element is deformed uh, and goes from being horizontal and is moved down, the resistive elements here, the little wires within the strain gauge are stretched and that increases the resistance. So we see an increase in the resistor one and as these are, are compressed on this side as it's, as it's bent on itself, the wires themselves are compressed and the resistance in those wires goes down as their cross-sectional area increases. So we have a, a bridge imbalance, but we can actually measure this voltage difference. And so these two strain gauges combined uh, will give us uh, an exquisitely sensitive uh, sensing apparatus for any kind of deformation. Most of our blood pressure transducers have a single um, surface or plate uh, which has a strain gauge usually on the, the ab luminal side, which is deformed as very small changes in that plate occur due to a uh, distending force created by the uh, arterial pressure waveform. Uh, now we'll transition to solid state transducers, and we discussed Wheatstone bridges, uh, and in a solid state transducer we have a silicon chip shown here. This is a uh, MLR microcath pressure sensor. So this entire apparatus is placed within the arterial tree. And within this pressure sensor, uh, the tip itself is blunt. The blood vessel would be traveling along this axis, or this would be traveling within the blood vessel. And the sensor element is right here, and it's actually etched onto a silicon chip. So it would actually be deformed uh, very minutely uh, by lateral pressure within the blood vessel itself. So this lateral distension or lateral uh, distending pressure is actually what the blood vessel wall sees. So that is what this sensing element sees. Uh, it, the silicon chip itself is rather stiff, uh, but it has many, many, many uh, resistive components etched back and forth across it. So that even very tiny uh, deflections of this silicon chip uh, register a large change in resistance, uh, which or then incorporated back to the rest of the Wheatstone bridge, uh, and deformations here are, uh, result in a change in voltage, which can be calibrated and then measured. 
we'd point out that there is a temperature compensation built into this to try and uh, accommodate any changes in temperature which occur. Uh, any kind of a resistive element uh, is going to be affected by temperature and depending upon the, re the material that uh, element is, is made of, uh, it can either go up or down with temperature changes. Once this is in the vascular tree, it's unlikely that the temperature that this device will actually see, uh, it's unlikely that that will change. Temperature is relatively uh, homeostatic. Uh, we need to keep in mind, however, that if we want to calibrate this uh, prior to implantation, it's best to calibrate it at body temperature. So have it kept in warm saline and uh, um, then calibrate it under those conditions. In addition, uh, all blood pressures are referenced back to ambient air. So in the doctor's office, our blood pressure is referenced back to whatever the ambient air pressure is. So even if we're in, in a high altitude situation, our systolic and diastolic pressures uh, are relative to ambient air pressure. So for these devices, there's actually a small air tube that runs the entire length of the catheter uh, and exits the catheter at, uh, uh, within the room so that the ambient air pressure uh, behind this sensing element is uh, always referenced. And as I pointed out, uh, because these are etched onto a silicon chip, the frequency response of a solid state transducer uh, is in the kilohertz range. So we looked at different uh, heart rates of even up to mice, uh, uh, a device capable of sensing pressure changes in the kilohertz range uh, will allow us to accurate ref accurately uh, measure pressure changes within uh, even a small mouse with a high heart rate. So overall, this uh, having the kilohertz range ability, having the sensor placed directly within the blood vessel and not having to compensate for any air bubbles in a system or any uh, lengths of catheters or things like that results in an overall higher fidelity. So what are the requirements of a solid state transducer? Uh, essentially, uh, these, these uh, have to be able to be used intravascularly, so you have to be able to place these into a blood vessel. How do we know what size catheter fits in what size vessel? Uh, generally speaking, these catheters range for preclinical models range from a one to seven French. Uh, French is an unusual uh, unit of measure, uh, used pretty much exclusively in the, in the catheter labs around the world, but there are three French per millimeter. So a one French catheter is 330 microns in diameter. Uh, so having that in mind, we see that there's a, a variety of different uh, configurations here and uh, uh, in different sizes. So the, what is the limitation of the solid state transducer? Well, there has to be a wire connection from the test subject uh, to a balancing circuit, again, for our Wheatstone bridge. Um, and to our amplifier. So this in turn would connect back to an amplifier. So we have our, our solid state transducer and our catheter uh, comes to a connector. The connector in turn is connected to a balancing circuit either here or here. This in turn is connected back to an amplifier. So there are physical connections between the animal and our recording apparatus, which brings us to the, the topic of telemetry. So we have uh, uh, different uh, implantable blood pressure sensors that uh, utilize technologies or telemetry technology. We have a fluid filled system with a very short catheter uh, with a uh, gel cap here that prevents any kind of movement of blood into the catheter and prevents clotting uh, connected to a transducer here. So our blood pressure transducer is here, which in turn is connected to a transmitter. So this entire uh, capsule with a tendon uh, catheter, in this case a couple of other extra electrodes, can be implanted within the animal and left there. Uh, the animal is placed in close proximity to a antenna, which can then uh, receive this transmitted signal and the antenna in turn is connected back to recording apparatus. We can also have a solid state uh, telemetry device. So in this case we would have a solid state transducer shown here. Uh, in this case, there is no fluid-filled catheter. The transducer is within the vascular tree itself, and that is then connected to a uh, 
uh, telemetry transmitter. Again, the antenna would be right outside the cage or placed under the cage and the animal is free ranging and the antenna receives a signal which is then moved back to the recording apparatus. Things to consider, the fidelity of implantable devices is good. Uh, even with the manometric system, the fidelity is good. Have to remember there is a metabolic price imposed upon the test subject associated with carrying the weight of an implanted telemetry device. So if the animal's big, uh, this, this weight is negligible. If the animal's small, uh, this weight can be, become something that, that's worthwhile considering. Uh, if you feel that uh, it's, the animal is actually, his physiology is being affected by carrying the weight of this device, then uh, you need to take that into account in interpreting your results. Uh, so imagine carrying a, a very light backpack around all day. Uh, is it noticeable? Do you really burn a lot of calories doing that? Maybe not. If you're carrying a 70-pound pack around, then it's probably noticeable. None of these are uh, have those kinds of weights proportionally, but uh, it gives you an idea of the concept. Uh, so everything we talked about in terms of fidelity and frequency response uh, applies to all these systems. Um, there is a cost associated with these. These are more expensive than either the manometric system per se or the solid state transducer per se. Uh, but you know, the uh, conversely, the animal is free ranging. He can move around the cage freely without any any interactions with the investigator. The investigator can be in the next room, uh, and there's no psychogenic effect, hopefully, of of these measurement apparatus. So for invasive uh, blood pressure measurements, we have we have question, the three questions we have are, are what do you need to measure for your experiment, uh, which will then determine what you need to use to measure the pressure, and uh, when when do you need to use it? Do you have to have continuous measurements, or you, can you make measurements uh, um, subacutely or, or just acutely? So again, uh, what do you need to measure for your experiment? If you need to accurately measure uh, a change in pressure over change in time uh, within the vascular tree, then you really need to be able to have a solid state uh, system probably. Um, when do you need to use it? Uh, that's always a, a tough question. If you have an experiment and you're, you're trying to uh, assess a particular intervention, it could be a drug, it could be a, a presser agent, it could be, be a, a hypotensive agent, it could be something that changes uh, the physiology of the animal uh, over time. Uh, it could be uh, tachyphylaxis associated with some sort of a pressor response. Uh, you, you could start with a, a catheter manometer system, and uh, if you saw there was some sort of a general trend, but you just weren't able to really pick up what you felt was an accurate uh, systolic and diastolic pressure, or you, you couldn't, if you couldn't see. Uh, within that pressure waveform, a dichrotic notch, that would be an indication that perhaps you need a, a better fidelity uh, within your manometric system or your measurement system. In that case, you might want to evolve uh, to a solid state system. So we'll have, uh, uh, in this case, we have, see that there, there are, in solid state devices, there, there are several different sensors uh, available in several different sizes. Uh, we see them ranging from uh, uh, one French all the way up in this table up to a, a five French and available for implantation or use with all these different uh, preclinical models. And this is only a partial listing. We can indicate also that there are several different uh, iterations and we can have s multiple sensors within the same catheter. Uh, so we can have, since the sensors actually measure pressure from a lateral aspect uh, along the uh, length of the catheter, we could have uh, more than one. We can have different curvatures. Uh, we can have, you notice here that the tips are straight or curved. They can uh, be angled so that they more easily uh, can access one particular branch of, a, of the vascular tree than another or introduced, can be introduced into the heart easily. So this is just a partial listing, but it gives you an idea that there is a, a wide variety of uh, options available. And, uh, careful consideration of what your requirements are will, will dictate what uh, system you might need. So in summary, we've discussed uh, invasive versus non-invasive invasive, uh, assessment of arterial pressure. We've uh, looked at uh, solid state and manometric techniques for invasive measurements. 
Uh, and finally, we, we want to look at uh, uh, overall what, what system would be best for you. Uh, if, if you're involved in, in drug screening, you want to look at a large class of drugs or a number of drugs within a specific class or compared to a, a known uh, drug uh, that affects arterial pressure, we could use a, a non-invasive uh, plethysmographic system. The beauty of this is we can screen large number of animals relatively easily. Uh, we could set up a system in which we could monitor 10 animals at a time. Uh, technicians are, are excellent at uh, being able to uh, utilize these systems and make accurate recordings uh, of or repeatable recordings over time. So this can at least identify uh, among a, a panel of drugs which drug might be of interest. Uh, then we can utilize a technique once we've uh, established which particular drug we have uh, a true interest in, we can come in and do a much more careful analysis of characterization of that drug. And in that case, we'd have to decide whether or not uh, we looked at a drug that just measured arterial pressure or affected arterial pressure per se uh, through some sort of a vasodilatory action, then we might want to just uh, be able to use a uh, catheter manometer system and get on the species of animal and what kind of fidelity we can, we can obtain. Uh, or if we had a cardiac drug uh, that we were very interested in looking at uh, changes in pressure and changes in time uh, within the heart itself, uh, we probably want to use a more solid state system in which we can have confidence in, in the, both the fidelity in terms of frequency response as well as phase lag. So. I'd like to start off the Q&A with a discussion around um, um, basically inconsistent and unstable blood pressure recordings due to anesthesia or effects in body temperature. And this is uh, um, most relevant to mice, I think. So, Tom, could you please comment on, on the importance of anesthesia and core body temperature and, and maybe share some best practices with our audience? Uh, certainly. So we've had a our, our laboratory has had experience uh, in measuring arterial pressure in, in both rats and mice, and we found that in mice, uh, in particular, just the influence of anesthetic, even a, even an anesthetic such as isoflurane, uh, which is relatively safe, uh, it uh, has quick recovery, but uh, even isoflurane will cause a, a dramatic uh, decrease in core temperature in a mouse. So we have to be aware of that and as the pressure, as the core temperature decreases, we can also have changes in arterial pressure in the mouse. So we have to be aware of that. Uh, we routinely will, will have the uh, mouse on a, on a warmed uh, uh, tray or table or pad uh, and keep uh, the mouse warm uh, during the entire experiment and monitor core temperature uh, using uh, thermocouples so that we can actually have a uh, feedback controlled warming pad that will maintain the animal's core temperature at normal physiologic uh, uh, temperatures. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd, point, I'd point out that most laboratories are relatively cold uh, for a mouse. Uh, most laboratories are kept uh, at a temperature that's comfortable for people, but that's really relatively cold for a mouse. Uh, so mice even just brought into a room are, are working a little harder to, to maintain core temperature. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, Brandon, any addition to that particular question? No, I think Tom's the expert on that one. I think he's got a good job there. Perfect. Okay. A um, question from Sachin's come in um, about, and, and actually a couple others, I believe Rita has asked this question as well, uh, but they're interested in the potential of blood clots either over the catheter in a solid state situation or even in the um, fluid filled situation. Uh, is, should this be a concern what happens here in most measurements? Does this does blood clotting perhaps affect the duration of recording that one could do? Uh, Tom, can you comment on this? I can. Uh, it depends again on your on your catheter system. If you have a solid state catheter, it's, it's less likely uh, to occur, although Brandon can discuss that. Uh, the uh, Fluid-filled manometric systems uh, do tend to have a certain amount of layering of blood into the catheter tip uh, as the catheter remains within the animal. Uh, each individual uh, pressure pulse tends to move a few red cells into the tip of the catheter, which is usually usually facing uh, 
uh, anti-grade or upstream of the uh, blood flow. So there is some uh, layering of fluid out of the catheter and blood into the catheter, which can then eventually uh, uh, clot and which will definitely attenuate arterial pressure measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, we use, routinely use a mild heparinized solution uh, to flush the catheters. We try not to heparinize the entire animal. Uh, mm -hmm. another, another technique is to have a very slow infusion uh, of fluid through the whole system uh, and the blood pressure waveform is superimposed upon that slight movement or gradual movement of fluid uh, through the catheter. Again, the, the rate of flow is so low that it doesn't really generate a pressure that uh, will artificially bias your recorded pressure. Mm -hmm. so, but you're, you're absolutely right. If, if you put a catheter in or it's a chronic catheter that's long term and it's only intermittently opened, uh, over time eventually that, that will clot off and uh, there's not much you can do about it. Keep in mind that if, we, if uh, you're doing a long term experiment during the day and the catheter system requires repeated flushing, then uh, additional fluid is being added to the vascular tree. So that may or may not have an effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Brandon, anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd also add that, um, I mean, it is an issue with both types of systems to some degree. Um, you know, you, you will see some um, deposits on top of the um, sensing elements um, during recording on a solid state system as well. Uh, the impact of that over an acute recording is is relatively negligible. The, the more important part actually is, is proper cleaning afterward. Um, the the way that those deposits actually make the most impact on your system is if they're left over from when you did your sampling yesterday. Um, and, and those dried or hard components um, will have a, a, a much larger impact on, on the quality of your, of your measurements um, later on. Perfect. And that's, I'm glad you moved in that direction because actually that was going to be my next question that have come in from a few audience members. Um, it's in terms of uh, basically the reusability of each one shown. So um, uh, fluid-filled catheters versus solid state, what's the reusability for a typical lab, what needs to be thought of, and, and uh, again, like what's the cleaning process to ensure that it is reusable and has a longer life. Uh, so any additional uh, kind of best practices that AD Instruments uh, prescribes to their users? Uh, yeah, I mean the... I mean, to address the manometric system, that one's uh, obviously quite simpler. Um, you can essentially, if you're, if that's a concern of yours, you can um, use a new catheter the next time. Um, it's relatively mm -hmm. inexpensive. Um, so, with a with a solid state catheter, um, you know, there is quite a bit of material that we provided, and and you know, your your manufacturer, your um, your supplier of those catheters can can get you this information. There's a really good bit of material on how to take care of those and that's the most important thing is to ensure that um, they're well taken care of. Um, you know in terms of the reusability um, the you know the solid state systems are, are going to greatly depend on, on how well you follow those um, those, those best practices. Um, so you know do some reading ahead of time um, get yourself familiar with the process of um, you know uh, both care during use but also um, cleaning and care post-use. Um, and if you do a good job at that, um, you're going to be able to reuse them um, uh, to, to a degree that, that you're going to be happy with. Um, so we have you know, a wide range of success to that degree, and it really is going to be completely dependent on, on that uh, care and use aspect. So um, that's, that's really the best answer we have for people on, on that one. OK. No, that's, that's great. Um... Next question, uh, Tom, in your experience, is there an effect or should scientists be aware of any circadian rhythm uh, when making their blood pressure recordings so that they can keep things consistent day to day and in their groups? Should they be making these, these measurements at the same time and is there any uh, effect uh, of circadian cycle on making a arterial blood pressure recording? Uh, thank you. Yeah, actually, there 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 is a dramatic uh, circadian cycle to both arterial pressure and cardiac output in rodents, particularly rats. Um, mm -hmm. It uh, animals are nocturnal, so generally speaking, they sleep all day. Uh, about four in the afternoon, the animals begin to uh, become more active. Their heart rate tends to increase. Their 
blood pressure and cardiac output also tend to increase. Uh, and then they remain active up until about uh, 6 or 6.30 in the morning, and then uh, they're, they all go to sleep, and their blood pressure is dropped back down. So uh, if, if one is really concerned about um, measurement of arterial pressure in a conscious animal, uh, you probably best go to a uh, reverse light dark cycle and do all your studies in the dark. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, make your make your measurement at the same time of day and be be aware that the animals uh, that you bring down during the day uh, were sleeping. So that uh, imagine being awakened in the middle of the night and someone uh, uh, puts you into a into a cylinder and and uh, puts something on your on your uh, on your leg and pumps it up. That's uh, it's going to be a little disorienting, particularly if you. Mm -hmm. if you you were asleep, so uh, those are all things to keep in mind. But it's best to make the measurement at the same time of day, uh, if you can, uh, in these species. Very good. Um, that's a great answer. Next question: What parameters would require solid-state pressure catheter fidelity, in your opinion? And could you give maybe some examples? I think if you really wanted to measure uh, an accurate systolic and diastolic pressure in a, in a rat or a mouse, uh, particularly a mouse, uh, you'd, you'd require um, a solid state system. It's really asking a lot of a catheter manometer system to be able to accurately measure um, systolic and diastolic pressure in the mouse. I think mm -hmm. your first, first clue uh, whether you have the adequate uh, fidelity is whether or not you can see a dichronic notch. Uh, within your within your uh, waveform, and uh, particularly if the mouse uh, is conscious, and you want to have a uh, either a tether or something like that, or if the animal is uh, uh, got a high heart rate, uh, basal heart rate, or you're testing a drug in the mouse, which causes an increase in heart rate. Uh, if it's a sympathomimetic, you would increase both uh, heart rate as well as arterial pressure. Um, so that could really uh, be very difficult to measure with a manometer system or a catheter system, uh, and you really would require a, a, a solid state pressure transducer. Okay. Uh, Brandon, any addition to that? Um, yeah, just just one uh, simple one. One of the things that Tom discussed earlier um, in the presentation was around phase shift. You know, one of the other key things to think about is what, if one of your outcomes is um, something that requires a um, a uh, high degree of accuracy in terms of um, temporal resolution or, or timing of a particular element um, in the signal, um, those phase shift elements are also going to impact that measurement as well. So um, think about that um, as, you're, as you're looking at your outcomes as well. Perfect. Okay. Um, another question, and maybe we'll make this our final one in the interest of time. Uh, is there an, like, is there a guide into which um, the I, what size catheter is ideal for uh, vessel or animal model. I think the reason why I'm asking this is we've had a question come in about how small a catheter could be used on a larger animal. And I think the, the question is coming from, for those that study uh, small animals and large, can you actually get away with using smaller catheters on larger vessels, larger animals, or is there a risk or anything to be concerned about in that situation? I think it depends on uh... Uh, what system you're using? If you're using a catheter manometer system, uh, you you can you can give up or uh, you can uh, lose certain degrees of fidelity by going with a smaller system. Uh, usually, in a larger animal, the heart rate is slower. Uh, surprisingly, the uh, systemic arterial pressures are very similar between uh, uh, pigs and dogs and rats and mice uh, and people. So that's 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 always a, a source of wonderment. But uh, if, if you have a larger animal, uh, you can put in a larger catheter and, and improve uh, the fidelity of the system. Uh, the downside is you don't want to have a catheter that's so large that it, it, it occludes the blood vessel. So mm -hmm. uh, usually you want to have something that is, is uh, you know, less than, than uh, you know, certainly less than, than 50 or 60 percent of the blood vessel shouldn't be, shouldn't be catheter. So, Need to need to think about that when you're when you're selecting a catheter system for a large animal. Uh, but if you had a solid state device, it wouldn't matter. Wouldn't really matter if it was a, a small diameter or a large diameter. They both would be accurate uh, mm -hmm. within that application. Perfect, Brandon. Anything to add on that? 
Yeah, just um, you know the the way we answer this question, or I do, uh, is is two points. I think you know the the larger catheters, you know, as it, as the question applies to solid state systems, the larger catheters are going to be a bit more robust. Um, so, you know, getting away with a larger catheter or or using a larger catheter will help you in that that regard. But I think another important point with large animals. Um, is the type of insertion that you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to insert a catheter in the femoral artery, and say, <clears throat> you know, you're not going to actually be able to travel up the vascular tree very far with a, with one of the smaller catheters. And the other issue with that is, you know, if you've got a lot of um, a lot of empty space in a in a um, in a vessel around your catheter, um, you can introduce some degree of artifact with that catheter moving around inside the vessel. Uh, right. so good point. Good point. Um, so it is a good idea to to do the best you can to to match up um, the size of your catheter system with the vessel you're actually putting it into.